Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome back for yet another episode of the X-Files Revisited. Today we're looking at Season 1, Episode 3, titled simply, Squeeze. Now as always, we're going through the entire episode, so if you haven't seen it, I urge you to watch that first and then come back and watch this. Anyways, let's get to it. The episode opens in Baltimore, Maryland. A businessman is walking down the street. A pair of creepy eyes observe him from the street sewer. Possibly a dancing clown. <laughs> Coming off an elevator, the man heads into his office. The elevator opening again and something is clearly crawling up the elevator shaft. After calling his wife, the businessman leaves his office and we see a screw on the vent begin to turn. Some very dirty fingers come out from inside the vent and did this guy learn nothing from the past two years about washing your hands? Upon returning to the office, the door slams behind the man and a loud struggle can be heard. The man having been murdered, we see the vent grate closing back up. Scully is seen cheating with this douche Tom Colton and you know, how dare she? They're former classmates and Tom is clearly Clearly the envious type that doesn't feel good unless he's tearing those down who are far more successful than he. You are one pathetic loser. Colton mocks Mulder and the X-Files and then asks Scully for her help because, well, he sucks at his job. Briefly explaining the case of how the man in the opening was murdered with no entry point, having his liver removed by hand. She sarcastically asks if he wants her to bring along Mulder, which we all know he does, he's just not man enough to say it. At the crime scene in George Usher's office, Baltimore, Maryland, Mulder asks Scully why they didn't just ask him for his help. She says they're friends of hers from the academy and that Mulder's methods are well. Spooky? Do you think I'm spooky? Colton arrives and formally meets Mulder. Colton tries getting a little snarky with Mulder, but it backfires. You said green men. A reticulant skin tone is actually gray. They're notorious for their extraction of terrestrial human liver. Mulder notices the vent is ajar and dusts it for fingerprints, all while Colton keeps him running his mouth. Shut up, bitch! An elongated fingerprint is found on the vent cover. Back in the X-Files office, Mulder compares the fingerprints to similar prints taken from 10 murders in the Baltimore area, noting three of the prints were taken from the Powhatan Mill in the 1960s and three in the 1930s. Mulder explains from the pattern of the prints that there are five kills every 30 years and they should expect two more. Scully asks if they're from a copycat and Mulder says the prints are the same, meaning they're from the same killer. Scully is her, well, usual skeptical self. What then? That, that, that this is the work of a hundred-year-old serial killer who's capable of overpowering a healthy six-foot-two businessman? And he should stick out in the crowd with ten-inch fingers. Scully tells Mulder it's Colton's case and they don't want his help. Mulder claims their X-Vile predates his case and suggests they conduct their own investigation separate from Colton's case. Scully types up her psychological profile of the killer, explaining he may be a maintenance or janitorial worker. She presents it and Agent Fuller, Colton's superior, asks Scully if she would like to come to the stakeout, while also taking a jab at the X-Files. If you don't mind working in an area that's a bit more down to earth. <laughs> During the stakeout in a parking garage, Scully hears a noise and nearly shoots Mulder. Mulder tells Scully her assumptions on where the killer would be is incorrect and he's heading home. Instead, she was actually correct and there's something or someone in the vents. A man comes out of the vent and this guy has creep written all over him. At FBI Bureau in Baltimore, Maryland, Eugene Victor Toombs, the man from the vent, is being questioned with a lie detector. Mulder and Scully watch with the other agents behind the two-way mirror. He appears to be passing the test for the most part. Mulder notices an anomaly in the polygraph and says she's right, that they have the right guy. Agent Fuller mocks Mulder and says he's letting Toombs go. Colton tells Scully he can get her off the X-Files. Scully questions why Mulder would push his theory knowing full well he would get mocked. Mulder responds and says he thought maybe she got the right guy. Scully says Mulder seemed to be acting territorial. In our investigations, you may not always agree with me. Or at least to respect the journey. Using a computer, Mulder elongates the fingerprints from tombs and they're a perfect match with the ones taken from the X-Files. Scully asks, how is this possible? We see Tombs staring from the bushes surveying his next victim. Tombs is seen scaling the side of the house while his victim is unaware, on the roof being stretching like Stretch Armstrong. Introducing super stretching superhero Stretch Armstrong! and makes his way inside through the chimney. The man tries starting a fire, noticing a lack of airflow, and just like Michael Myers, Tombs comes from the shadows and attacks. The man's liver was removed and Colton is just freaking out because he can't figure out what the hell's going on. Mulder arrives and Colton does not want him around, saying he only wants qualified members of the investigating team and Mulder rightfully roasts him. What's the matter, Colton? You worried I'm gonna solve your case? Scully tells him that obstructing Mulder's investigation could stick out on his personal file because all this petulant child cares about is getting credit. Mulder finds more elongated fingerprints near the fireplace and notes that he must have taken something. At the station, Scully notes Toombs' apartment was a cover. He never lived there and hasn't shown up for work. Mulder, meanwhile, 
meanwhile, finds Toombs' old address from census records showing he murdered the person above him in 1903. Mulder says they need to track Toombs down as he's killed four people, leaving one victim left. And if they don't get him now, the next time they can get him. If we don't get him right now, the next chance we're going to get is in... Uh... 2023. All right, so in a few months, we'll have a stretchy liver-eating serial killer on our hands. While searching through records, Scully finds the current address of the investigator that originally investigated the murders of 1933. Retired Sheriff Frank Briggs recounts his experiences with the case to the agents. Briggs asks Mulder to hand him a box containing all the evidence he collected on the case. Briggs claims he knew the murderers in 1963 were by the same person in 1933. He notes family members of the victim said small personal items were missing from each crime scene. He also managed to take photos of tombs from 1963 and he appears completely unaged. The agents head to 66 Exeter Street where Tombs originally lived. The agents head inside Tombs' old apartment, room 103, guns drawn. Mulder moves an old dirty mattress that definitely doesn't have any bed bugs, revealing a hole in the wall. Mulder being the gentleman that he is, of course, lets Scully go ahead first. They arrive in an old coal cellar and find a table full of random items. They find what appears to be a nest of some sort made out of rags and newspapers and ooh, something else. I think it's bile. Is there any way I can get off my fingers quickly without betraying my cool exterior? Mulder theorizes this is where he hibernates and Scully doesn't buy it like usual. Hibernates? Mulder sends Scully to get a surveillance team and Mulder stays to keep watch. Scully gets snagged on something only for it to be Toombs who has taken her necklace. Two agents join Mulder in the car to do surveillance and mock him, calling him spooky. Colton throws a hissy fit like a little bitch because Mulder asked his men to watch the building. Colton has it called off and Scully calls him out. Is this what it takes to climb the ladder, Colton? All the way to the top. Then I can't wait till you fall off and land on your ass. Toombs is seen stalking Scully from some bushes. She calls Mulder from her bathroom, but gets his answering machine instead. Mulder is back at the nest and finds Scully's necklace, signifying to him that she's the next victim. We're three episodes in, and Scully is about to get into a bath for the second time. You know, I really, really like where this show is headed so far. However, stupid tombs ruin it with his disgusting bile. Well, that hideous creep doesn't scare me. <laughs> Mulder frantically tries calling Scully on the phone while she searches her apartment with her gun. Toombs grabs her leg from the baseboard vent and then comes bursting out. Mulder arrives at the apartment and is rushing to Scully. Toombs and Scully are struggling on the ground and Toombs is trying to tear out her liver. Mulder arrives and the two agents subdue and handcuff Toombs to the bathtub. Detective Briggs sees in the paper that Toombs was caught, bringing a tear to his eye. Toombs is locked up, licking newspaper and making another nest. Mulder and Scully watch him and Scully notes he has an unusual muscle and skeletal system, along with a decreasing metabolic rate. Mulder ignores her and notes all the high-tech security systems people install these days. They just aren't enough. Toombs has brought some food and just stares at the small slot in the door. Squeeze is the first of many Monster of the Week style episodes. It was made as a deliberate attempt by Chris Carter to prove that the series could be more than just aliens. And as much as I like the mythology storyline arc episodes, my favorites are really the Monster of the Week. These one-off episodes are really missing from modern television that only want to follow, you know, one main narrative. Toombs is played by Doug Hutchison and brings a really creepy vibe to the character, which is fitting seeing as how Doug himself is probably even creepier than the character he's portraying. Now if you don't know anything about him, he grew and married a 16-year-old by the name of Courtney Stodden. He was 51 years old at the time. She apparently met him at an acting workshop he was hosting, which makes it even more disgusting. And even though her parents were supportive of the decision, it's still creepy as all hell. Despite all of that, this episode is one of the best of season one, and I would say the series as a whole. Toombs is an excellent antagonist for the agents to investigate, and the story is unique and interesting. Anyways, that's all for today. If you missed the last episode, Deep Throat, you can check it out here. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you could subscribe, turn on notifications, and like the video that would help me immensely thanks for watching and keep watching the skis uh skies